to Otter Creek Audubon's first cabin fever lecture for the winter. It's the, I'm, I'm Mike Winslow, I'm the president of Otter Creek Audubon. This is the first of three that we'll be doing, one per month uh, through the winter. This now uh, February and October. I have um, a poster kind of showing what all the other presentations will be. I'll leave a couple of them over there. There's uh, certainly not enough to go around. We've got a great turnout tonight. Very excited to see that. Uh, these are also up, the, the announcements are also upstairs in the library here, and we'll have them in the Addison, Addison Independent each week before they show up. Uh, tonight, we're privileged to have Doug Blodgett, a wildlife biologist with the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's been there for 26 years. Uh, he works on game and non-game issues, part of the rattlesnake recovery team. He's part of the uh, wild turkey team. And he's also responsible for handling sightings of catamounts throughout the state. And he's going to share with us some of his experience and knowledge of catamounts in Vermont and throughout the country. So, OK. Good. Thank you. Uh, apparently, there isn't much for excitement going on in Middlebury on a Thursday night. It's a pretty good crowd. Um, I, I uh, just give you a quick summary of how I even came to become involved with mountain lions. I'm an old woodchuck, a Vermonter from generations, so uh, we've been around a while, and you know, so I'm familiar that the catamounts were once part of the landscape here, uh, extirpated in about. 1881, so the story goes, with the last uh, lion shot in Barnard. And that lion's on display at the pavilion in Montpelier in a little glass case. And it looks pretty sorry uh, at this time. But, um, but we get, as most of you folks probably know, our department gets lots of catamount sightings every year. And I handle somewhere around you know, 40 to 60 sightings a year anyway. And those are just the ones that manage to get funneled back to my office. I'm sure there are other reports that don't get to my office. I'm sure there are other sightings that don't even get reported. Um, <clears throat> but for the longest time, <clears throat> we get these sightings, and, and, and there was no one on staff that had any real experience with this animal. And we'd kind of look at each other and look around and you know, kind of shrug our shoulders and not really know what the deal was. So. Um, and that happened every time. So I cooked up a little idea and talked my boss into, uh, I said, how come every time we have one of these sightings, you know, none of us knows what to do. We don't really know what, what the score is. And uh, talked him into letting me go out west for just a really short little period of time. Too, too terribly short. And I was able to work with uh, uh, Wyoming Fish and Game Department and the Arizona Game and Fish Department for just a short time. And the whole idea was to go out there and get exposed to their ongoing uh, mountain lion research programs and in a short time learn as much as I possibly could about this critter and come back and try to take a, a considered focused look at, at this animal here in Vermont um, and try to make some sense of, of all these sightings. So, we can talk about that tonight, uh, you know, we will. Uh, I think first though, what I'd like to do is spend a little time talking about uh, behavior and um, my experiences in the West, what I learned out West, and, and we can talk about uh, life histories and biology and stuff like that first, and then we can get to the Vermont situation. Um, are you guys gonna be able to find some seats or? So I have went, been with the Fish and Wildlife Department for 26 years, and it's a pretty cool job. And, I, and over that 26 years, I've been very fortunate. I've worked on some really neat critters. And uh, there isn't one of them that I've worked on that I don't just think is, is really cool and really well set up for, for what, is, what it does. Um, I've worked on a black bear project where we actually crawled into bear dens and tranquilized the mothers. And, crawled in there and got the cubs and we take them out and put them in our coats and keep them warm and while we're working on the mother and that's pretty cool. Um, I've been into a bunch of bat caves and census bats and that's really kind of interesting. I've been uh, trapping wild turkeys. We did that for a while. I'm Vermont's wild turkey biologist so we've trapped and transferred a bunch of birds around the state and that program is hugely successful as most of you know. Um, more recently, I've been um, involved with 
uh, Jim Andrews in working on the Vermont's uh, struggling uh, rattlesnake population and gone to some of the dens and, and done some census work, and that's really, really exciting. Um, <laughs> so it, it's been very cool. Um, but you know, bats and rattlesnakes, I mean, these are critters that have faces that only a mother really could love. <laughs> and, but that's different than this one. This, I mean, just, I mean, really, just one look is worth a thousand, thousand words. Just tremendously charismatic animal. We had them here once. They used to roam the state. Let's see, can we just uh, maybe hit the lights? Incredibly beautiful. Uh, that's good. Sleek, graceful package. Um, this is a female. Uh, maybe some of you will develop a feel for this through the program, but the females tend to be a little slighter, a little finer detailed in the face. Just a, a more of a sleeker, uh, smaller package here than the, the more robust males. Um, and they are just one of the coolest critters I've ever seen. Um, the first time I saw one in the West, it was like a ghost, and I literally got goosebumps. It was, it was in a tree, and it saw us, and then just took off. In one bound, it was gone. It was just like a ghost, and I was just in awe. I still am. Um, so I have tremendous respect for, for this critter. Um, you can see that uh, the eyes are pretty big. The, the, the brain puts quite a bit of effort into, into uh, visual stimuli here for this critter. Um, Cats, unlike dogs, the canines, wolves, uh, coyotes, foxes, that use their sense of smell a lot to communicate with the world. Uh, the mountain lion hunts pretty much with its, mostly with its eyes and some with its ears. And that's not to say that they don't use their nose for scenting. There's a lot of olfactory communication that goes on uh, between mountain lions where they leave scat, where they leave scent, where they leave uh, scent mounds. And so there's a lot of olfactory communication there. But for hunting, this is a critter that pretty much relies on its eyes and ears as opposed to its nose for hunting. Um, let's see, how do we? Got quite the little uh, audiovisual mecca going on here tonight. We got this PowerPoint slideshow. I also brought a um, videotape uh, of some capture work that we did in the West. So hopefully this is all going to come together and pan out. <clears throat> mountain lions were probably, of the mammals, probably one of the most widely distributed mammals in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, until more recently where, again, as you know, they've been extirpated pretty much from the eastern U.S. except for Florida, struggling population in Florida. Um, we once thought we had about 32 subspecies of mountain lions in the Western Hemisphere. And some more recent developments in uh, DNA techniques and uh, DNA investigations have sort of revealed that instead of 32 subspecies, we probably really only have about six. Um, we have got one uh, genetic subspecies pretty much for all of North America, uh, essentially from Nicaragua north, is one subspecies of lion. So they're all related. Um, we have another subspecies in Central America down to South America, and then four more subspecies in South America. So that's, it went from about 32 subspecies down to six. Okay, um, this is a part of my trip to uh, Wyoming, and this is the location. This is the um, Snowy Mountain Range in Wyoming, if any of you are familiar with that. This is the Great Basin here of Wyoming, which is now pretty much littered with a lot of energy, uh, coal bed methane plants and stuff. All that's, that's happening here. This is the uh, Snowy Mountains and the Sierra Madre range, mountain range here. This is the um, Wind River mountain range in Wyoming, Powderhorn Mountains. This is uh, heading into the Black Hills of South Dakota here. Colorado's down here. And this is pretty much the first series of bumps that you hit after you get off the Great Plains. And so the wind just whips through here constantly, all the time. It's just whipping like crazy. It's the windiest spot on Earth that I've ever been to. Um, every night when we watch, we're always watching the weather for tracking conditions and stuff like that. And every night 
uh, you could depend that it was going to say windy. <laughs> so again, they used to th think that there were sort of discrete lion populations here in these different parts of these couple of states. But now we know that uh, all these lions in these different ranges are all interbreeding and uh, <coughs> genetically related. They, they, one, of the function, one of the features of mountain lions is they're just highly mobile. They can really cover some ground if they want to or need to. And so these are all genetically mixed together, in fact, pretty much throughout North America. Here's, uh, this was our study area where we were out to capture, oh, I forget. I think they had, I don't know, uh, almost 20 mountain lions. Um, <clears throat> Collard here. Um, this is the town of Laramie. Um, we we saw a lot of uh, interaction between these two mountain ranges here, Sierra Madres and the Snowies. So when I got uh, out of the airport, I, I was really anxious to see where we were going to be working, and um, I got hopped in the truck and went out to these mountains, these snowy mountains. And I was kind of disappointed. I thought, wow, that's, that's it? That's what we're working in? But it was only because I hadn't spent time in them that I was not impressed. Um, the closer you got and when you get in, it, these were really rugged. These were really steep, steep, rugged country. Uh, somewhere between, I don't know, probably about, I would say, 5,000 feet here up to about 9,500 feet. And um, you notice there's cattle in this picture. And the whole issue of predation by lions on domestic cattle is a huge issue in the West. Uh, but what's interesting is in the northern part of the country, um, uh, northern Rockies, uh, mountain lions don't seem to really bother too much with cattle, which is, which is really interesting because in the s southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, it's a really huge problem, and it's a real political problem, and uh, the ranchers get pretty darn upset. You do not screw with the cattle, um, and so that causes problems. But interestingly enough, we have, we have these cattle out here in this range, and we really don't see much of an interaction. In the south, about 30% of the diet of lions was uh, domestic cattle. And it's really a function of management, how they, how they pasture their cattle uh, or free range them and Wyoming versus just in Arizona, they just get on a piece of public land and pretty much let them go. Okay, um, this is what where we found most of our lions hanging out in this this country here, and they were always hanging out on this edge. We didn't find much of any lions back in here in the in what, what I call the interior, the deep dark interior. But on the edge, where you had these fingers of cover coming down here, uh, this is where all the lions were hanging out, because this is where all the deer and elk were hanging out. This was, this was winter elk and deer range. Uh, these were pretty much south and southwesterly exposed slopes here, highly windblown, so the snow is not collecting here. It's, it's blowing off. And because of that, the deer and elk would work their way down in through these patches of cover, this bit of security cover, and kind of hang out in these edges and feed. And where you had deer and elk, you had mountain lions predating on them. This is what those bare areas looked like. You had you know, these strips of cover that they would travel through, the deer and elk would travel through, use as security cover. They come out here to feed. Again, this is all wind blown, pretty much you know, open uh, where they can feed. So that's why the lions were there. This is looking back into what I call that sort of deep, dark interior. Snows were really deep in there, five or six feet, uh, just pile up. We had almost no elk or deer in there, and therefore no lions. In fact, we did have one sub-adult lion in there, kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> didn't, didn't make it because it didn't know enough not to go there. These are some um, radio telemetry locations. Uh, these lions had what we call store on board collars or radio collars where we'd fit the collars and 
the signals, the locations are bounced up to satellites, bounced back down and stored on board the collar on this little disk. This information were the exact location, so you'd get a dot. Um, and you could, re you could program that, that uh, collar to take a location, a satellite location, every, you know, anywhere from 20 minutes to four to six or eight hours. And so here you can see that all our locations of these different lions were all on that edge habitat that I showed you earlier. Almost nothing here in the interior. And then we also had, um, this is almost the uh, Wyoming Colorado border here, we had lions that were literally crossing the state border between Wyoming and, and Colorado. Sort of uh, kind of like near Estes Park area, that north and easterly part of uh, Colorado. So what we do is, the, the idea was to catch as many lions as we could and put collars on them in this, in this study unit. And we used any method of transportation you could think of to just cover a lot of ground and look for tracks. That was pretty much the idea. So we would take a Jeep sometimes and ride these roads, these, these trails, these four-wheel drive roads, and you're just riding along slow looking for tracks, um, fresh tracks. Now, because of the wind, you'd be going along, and then all of a sudden you'd hit, you know, three, four, five-foot drift. So that would stop you. So then you get the you know, snowshoes out and you keep on going. Um, other days when we knew, depending on where we were going, we just would spend a couple hours loading up um, snowmobiles, snowshoes, and then a couple of hounds, a couple of chase hounds. So the idea is you get a nice fresh track, which in that windy country is really tough. Um, the window for, for, for finding a good fresh track to put the dogs out on is really small because you need, it's best to have a nice fresh snow and then have lions tracking around on it and then you go by before the wind blows the track away and uh, pick up that hot scent and turn the dogs loose on it. So it's a very tiny window. So we put about three weeks worth of effort, for example, into catching a single lion. It kind of takes a while to pin it down. They had other lions call it in the area. so. We knew before we left, I mean, you don't want to be chasing another collared lion because you've already collared it. So, <clears throat> But it was covering a lot of ground through all kinds of different modes of transportation. This is just uh, some of the snow depths here. This is Dugan. He, Dugan's the hounds, man, he owns a couple of the hounds of, of the chase dogs. And he knows a lot about lions. He's literally chased lions all over the Western Hemisphere, down South America. and. Orange County, California, and, and uh, these remote parts of Wyoming, Colorado. Now, unlike those snow depths I just showed you, you get on this really nice winter deer winter range and elk winter range. These nice south-facing slopes. Again, a lot of solar, a lot of solar coming in here, a lot of wind blown. So the snow depths are next to nothing, and that's why. The deer and elk are there because they don't have to pound around in deep snow and waste a lot of energy looking for food. And then they come down here and make all these, these are all elk tracks and deer tracks down in here. So we would cruise through these, this winter range on snowmobile in this case, and you're just cruising along and just looking for tracks, fresh lion tracks. And they were pretty good at it. I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know how fast they were going, not real fast, but faster than I could, you know, discern the difference between all these tracks and, say, a lion track. They were pretty good at it. So we spent pretty much all day doing that, wherever, all over the place. Here's uh, just a typical uh, close-up of what that range looks like. A lot of sagebrush country, a lot of rocky ground. Um, Deer and elk country. This is a um, picture of a lion track kind of following an elk track. And you can see these tail drag marks here. Can you see that? And that's the kind of stuff these people were picking up on those snowmobiles or, or, or uh, you know, snowshoeing or in the Jeep, whatever. 
I just put this in to show you, talk a little bit about how this whole issue of predation. Um, most of the time, lions are killing their prey by attacks to the back, back of the neck, usually at the base of the skull. And you'll find puncture wounds there. Uh, if you find a, a deer kill, there's a bunch of sign we'll look for here, but if you're in doubt, you skin the neck. And you, you should see a bunch of trauma around the neck. And um, generally, they, they, they tend to attack from the, from the top and then just pinch that, um, break that vertebrae here and, and sever the spinal cord. Sometimes they'll just latch onto the throat area and just suffocate the animal. Um, generally, the larger animals is, is how they, they do this. But most of the time, again, it's from the back. Um, as I mentioned to you, in, in, in the Southwest, um, domestic cattle were, were a pretty good part of the critter's diet. And these 150-pound animals were taking down even up to 800-pound um, uh, cows, cattle, female cows. And they would do that by pretty much clamping onto the nose of the cow and just clamping down and hanging on. And then they kind of twist and try to twist that cow's head and have it trip and fall down. And once they got it down, it was pretty much over. Uh, they would stand there for a while and, and struggle, but once they got them down, they just clamp right on. So that's how these really small, much smaller animals were, were taken down, you know, seven, eight hundred pound mature cow um, cattle. Most of the time, if they're going after cattle, though, it's either calves, you know, up to maybe 300 pounds or so. But can you just imagine how they could have the strength and ability to do that? Um, female with, female with uh, cubs, um, she would probably go through, say, an elk maybe a week, say, or um, a single male lion. Uh, in other words, the needs, the needs of the family group were, were greater, obviously, than the, than the single lions. So uh, usually an elk would, would be a better feed than, than a deer. But, you know, in general, maybe, maybe uh, a deer a week, every week and a half or so, something like that. So we're getting up every day and heading out. And this was the first lion track that I saw. Uh, this is an old track. Um, and there's about six inches of snow here. And I just wanted to show you this is a very typical shape of an older lion track. It's sort of a teardrop shape. So the lion steps in like this and then lifts out cleanly. So you end up with this teardrop kind of deal. And that's very characteristic. So you're looking for that. This was a lion kill site, and these are this is this is a classic, typical kill site here of a, a mule deer. Um, the paunch contents are pretty much taken away and, and just placed over here on the side. They don't mess much with the paunch. They just kind of take the contents, shuttle them away. Then they like to drag the the critter, the prey itself, into sort of a, a more of a covered vegetative covered area like a small little cubby. Or an overhanging tree, or you know, they like that security, so they kind of pull that in here. And there's a lot of this uh, for, uh, hide around, and that behavior is called plucking, where they and it's not really plucking. We learned it's not; they're really not plucking it out. They're actually shearing uh, the fur off these animals uh, to get down to the hide. So these are all characteristic features of a lion kill. Now, you have to realize we're in a deer wintering area or elk winter range, so we're going to have some mortality that's not caused by, you know, actual lion predation on the deer or the elk. And so you kind of have to, I mean, some of them are just going to starve. Uh, so you kind of have to be able to discern, okay, how would how'd this thing die? Was it through predation? Or perhaps, you know, it just got so weak and then they, and then they you know, knocked it off. Here's another lion kill. Um, in this one, if you probe around, we found two, two real big canine marks in the skull. Uh, some more trauma to the neck here. This obviously hadn't been worked on for very long. 
This is another very characteristic uh, kill site. You know, it's not in the winter, but uh, they always, the cats have a penchant for covering their prey once they, they feed on it. So this lion would come in after he made the kill, would feed, say, for a night, and then before he leaves, he covers the carcass or attempts to. Um, so when you come upon a covered carcass, you pretty much can be relatively certain that that, that lion's going to come back. So they'll come back and feed night after night. And when it comes back the next time, it'll take that carcass and drag it 15, 20 feet, feed again, and then cover it again. And they might do that for several nights, particularly in cold weather. Uh, they're, they're not big on carrion. They don't like a lot of... It's not to say they don't use it, but for the most part, they're, they're not real big fans of kind of rotten carrion. They like fresh kills. They like fresh meat. Um, so when you saw a carcass that was killed that is not covered, then you assume, okay, all the feeding activity that's going to happen here has happened. It's only when they cover it you can expect they're probably going to come back. So when we see covered carcass, that was a great site to kind of hone in on and see if we could pick up some fresh, some fresh sign. Okay, so a week and a half goes by, we get a little half inch storm, uh, snow that night. Miraculously in the morning, it's not windy, and we go out and we find this nice fresh track. And this was, this is the first fresh one that we saw. Um, this is a left, left uh, print, paw print, and if you take your hand like this, and you can almost, this long toe here, corresponds with your middle finger. So this is the left side right here. Okay. So fresh track. Okay, great. So we put the dogs, have the dogs with us and we turn them loose. And um, it's interesting that the dogs ran. Uh, these are highly trained hounds. They're very valuable to these guys. They wouldn't sell them to you for a lot, a lot of money. But it's interesting that the dogs don't run on the track necessarily. They tend to run on the side over here. And they're picking up small molecules of scent on these tiny pieces of vegetation. So you always see them kind of running off the side. And I couldn't figure that out at first. But that's what they're doing. Now Dugan, the guy I showed you a picture of, he, he saw this track. And he said, yeah, probably, probably a smallish female. Um, this is the kind of country this was, and it was steep, and it was rugged, and we covered some ground. And I'm awfully glad when I was there I was a lot younger, because <laughs> this was tough. This was really tough. It was extremely rigorous, and it, it was a real bear. So here we're coming out of the truck. Um, we've got all this junk we're carrying with us, and of course, new meat. The idea is you give all the, the heavy stuff to the new meat. That's <laughs> That's pretty much SOP. That's the way it works. Um, but, and we're just now, the idea is we just try to keep up with the dogs. We do have radio telemetry gear that we have the dogs call it as well, but for some reason, we never took that uh, stuff out to, to, uh, to locate those dogs. And, and there were a couple times we didn't quite know where they were. I didn't know where I was the whole time. <laughs> Um, but we went a long, long ways. I think we ended up about 13 miles from the truck. And it was up and down that really steep, and I was, it was really tough. And I figured they were just trying to impress me, you know. <laughs> um, so we started this lion at uh, about 8.30 in the morning and caught up to it about 5 o'clock at night, about 13 miles away. So the deal is you, you, you'd... you'd follow the dogs and you hear the dogs and the dogs would have a lion treed like up here say. So, okay, all right, and you get up over this, up, 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 and you get over there. And, you know, you might get a gl glimpse. But by that time, it's taken us so long to catch up, this critter is all rested. He jumps out of the tree, he's gone for another long, long way. <laughs> Another couple, three hours, the, the cat, that this one here, the one I have the video of that I'm going to show you, we treed at least four times, at least. And um, it jumped out three, at least three of those times. Those are the ones we knew about. And boy, it was discouraging to 
finally get there and then just to have it I mean it was it was cool it was great but it, boy <laughs> the idea is to get a collar on it so okay so you finally catch up and uh, they're up there and you deliver a tranquilizer right right here in the hind end where there's a lot of good muscle and hopefully you get a good shot everything goes right the drug takes two things happen many times the lion once you shoot just takes right off it jumps out of the tree and takes off and then you have a tranquilized lion so that's a whole different deal no more dogs you keep the dogs back keep them unleashed somebody stays with the dogs you take off just tracking the animal because you can't be chasing a tranquilized lion um, the other part of the time the other half of the time they'll just fall asleep up in the tree <laughs> so then you gotta go up and get them and you tie a rope around them and lower them down and once you get them on the ground we do all kinds of measurements and uh, attach the radio collars uh, take all kinds of measurements any idea what sex this one is female, female. right good just a, just a finer kind of head and just a little more dainty looking. Still absolutely beautiful. Do you do blood work on the line? Yeah, we take blood work for uh, DNA. This is just some of the equipment here. Uh, these are big. These are big paws, and um, those claws are serious business. Serious business. Um, this animal we know uh, had pups. It was uh, cubs, um, a lactating female. It's not currently lactating, but we know this animal has a history of lactation because these nipples are swollen uh, and darkened in color. So we know that at one point this female had, had cubs. we take a, what they call a dental print of each lion so you can learn a lot about an animal by its teeth and there's a whole bunch of different techniques to aging and I can't tell you what they are because it's quite a long list but you look at features like this is a younger animal um, the teeth start out slope this way between the incisors slope this way and then they gradually wear down and wear down so the teeth actually straighten out and then finally they wear down uh, in this direction. The canine length is also key to age. The eruption of what we call the canine ridge, which is this tiny little ridge right across here. You can almost see this little bump over here. Uh, that's another age indicator. That's probably a, probably a three and a half, four year old lion when they have that canine ridge um, present like that. Gum recession, the level of gum recession is another age indicator. Uh, the coat color is another age indicator. So there's lots of different things. But each line we caught, we did a dental print. Uh, this, this is the biggest lion they got. And this is a huge critter. This one's a male. And this is a great big, big guy, he weighed about 180. Females went, uh, oh, anywhere from, say, adults were like maybe 85 to maybe 120. And the adult males were from, you know, 120 to maybe 160, this one 180. Pounds. Yeah, pounds, yep. Uh, the male home ranges are huge. Maybe it, it all depends. Uh, they vary in size depending on the prey base. The greater the amount of prey and the greater the prey density, the smaller their home range can be. But the males usually were upwards around 75 square miles to maybe a couple hundred square miles. And then the females within that, uh, in this case, this alpha tom here, uh, there might be several females and their home ranges are quite a lot smaller, maybe 25 to maybe 50 square miles or so. So he's, he's servicing. Uh, several females here. Um, one of the predators of lions are mountain lions. They, males especially, will kill cubs. They'll kill um, other adults, particularly females. 
if you talk to professional folks like you know biologists like me they, the the story is they kill cubs because the males don't want competition from another male coming up to take his place if you talk to some of the lion hunters out there they'll tell you they're killing those cubs because they want to bring that female back into heat so that they can breed her again it's a good idea um, <laughs> And I don't know for sure. There may be truth to each, each of those statements. Uh, but um, so a female will have cubs um, every two-year uh, two period. Uh, up until about age one or so, maybe not quite age one and a half. They're very dependent on the mother. They don't, do it, they don't hunt. Uh, they're reliant on their mother for their, for their food. About... 16, 18 months or so is when the sub-adults begin to start hunting on their own and they start weaning themselves away uh, from their mother. The, the female cubs will, sh will tend, the mother tends to kind of allow them to, to have a home range that's fairly close to the adult female, their mother. The sub-adult males, on the other hand, are pretty much, they're, they're, they're going places. They're out looking for hopefully an unoccupied piece of ground, large piece of ground, that there's not one of these guys looking for them. Because if they find them, they'll kill them, if they can. Um, and those, those, those sub-adult dispersals are how you spread genetic material through the landscape, um, and how you get, there's this constant flow of sub-adult lions running all over the place and uh, attempting to breed. Then about two and a half years old, they become uh, sexually mature and will begin to reproduce on their own, both, both male and female. <clears throat> um, I think, yeah, that's all I have on that. So what I have here next is to show you is a um, short video, like three or four minutes of this capture that we did of this one that I have the pictures of. But, uh, I'm wondering, do we want to? Anybody got any questions right now before we? Yeah. Can you show us how big height, height and length one would be? Well, like maybe like about like that. To the head? Well, no, not to the head. To the back, maybe. This is a big male. Yep. And that one there is probably close to eight feet long from nose to tail. It, it's too bad somebody wasn't lying next to that because they're huge. They're huge. It's almost eight feet. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a giant critter, that one. How long is the tail in proportion to the body? Well, just almost quite, almost about as long as the body, almost. So you said the males kill cubs. Will they kill their own cubs or only cubs of other males? No. They'll, they, they're not discriminating like that. They... No. Mm -mm. Pretty ruthless, sounds like. <laughs> when you were finished with all this data collection, what happened to the line? Oh, it just. Oh, you mean after after we're all done? Yeah. Oh, oh, we, the collar comes off and it's out there doing its thing. Oh, but oh, but you wanted to collar them and you tranquilized them. Yeah. And you put the collar on, and you measured everything. And yeah. then what do you do? Oh well, then 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 it's got a, a constant signal that's that's yeah. both. Yeah, can, but does it just wake up by itself, or? Oh it, yeah, 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 it, yeah. It just kind of wakes up and kind of gets up and grogs around for a bit, and then just goes off. Oh okay. Uh, how long how long do you have? Well, once you dart them, uh, you'll see in the video here, but. Um, <laughs> it's probably, I mean, if they get a lot of adrenaline going, sometimes they can almost shake it off a little bit. But if everything goes right, about five to seven minutes for the animal to go down. And then you get to it. We put, in this conditions, these winter conditions, we put a blanket under it, to, you know, because it can't uh, keep its own uh, body heat. So we cover it. and. Uh, we have about 45 minutes to work on it. 
and then you'll get hints when you're working on it that it's starting to come out. <laughs> and then it's time to wrap things up. <laughs> yeah. Evidently, they took the collars off after period. Yeah, well, uh, these guys did, they have collars now that, that, that are timed to blow off. I mean, they, they just small little uh, caps explode and it separates the collar. These had, they're called breakaway. These had some kind of other breakaway feature, but that's if you can't get back there to get that collar up. For, for whatever reason, you can't catch it again. And, and it is a challenge to recapture these animals that have been captured because they've been through this, you know, process and, you know, they'd rather not do it. And <laughs> it's a challenge. But they'll go to great lengths to get those collars. I mean, they're up in helicopters. They're spending big money to get them because that information may have been on there for four or five months. It has all those locations every couple hours. That's very valuable data. They, and that's the whole reason for doing it. So, Okay, let's just show this real quick, and then we can talk some more. Okay, so <laughs> now what I have to do is... Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is a this is about five o'clock at night. And there's the dogs that have finally managed to get this critter up in a tree. <clears throat> The pro part of the problem here is it's starting to get a little darker, and so uh, we're kind of anxious to get this job done. The cat. This indeed is a juvenile. Well, it's yeah, juvenile female, subadult female, weighed 85 pounds. There's a tail sticking down below. So you kind of like to have the dogs around making noise. It helps keep the cat up in the tree. The dogs? No, the cat. Oh, oh gosh, yeah. The dogs are. So uh, now we're just scoping it out, and it, you know we're going to get together the drugs in in the dart to uh, dart it. It is a tough shot, and you'll see here. He takes a shot, and there's so much brush in the way, it never even touches the, the lion. <laughs> Am I in your way? I'm sorry. <laughs> I've, I've seen it. It's about, it was about eight below this day. Okay, so here he's getting ready. So he's got a pistol, which surprised me. I think he'd use a rifle, but um, he sets it on a fork stick for, for a good handhold. Um, part of the reason for using a pistol is because it's less powerful and it's you know easier on the, on the animal. So you'll see this cat react as soon as he shoots. Okay, just shot, hit the brush, didn't never touch him. <laughs> Her. Yeah. Okay, so now reload the dart, and now we're going to a different spot, different. And this time he makes a real good shot, hits it right in the hip, right where you're supposed to. Here it comes. Isn't that the coolest thing you've ever seen? Okay, so now it's taken off. Now this is the fun part. So, okay, you got a darted lion out there. Okay, no dogs. Take the dogs away. Uh, quiet everything down. And then just you track it. You're out there and you're just tracking it through the snow. And this animal is doing everything it can to lose you. Crawling under, you know, sage and through brush and under juniper and everything it can do to 
you know, confuse you. And, um, you know, you kind of want to get there. You, you know it's going to take a little while, and you, you know it's got a tranquilizer in it, so you want to get there. So you're tracking along, tracking along, tracking along. All of a sudden, no tracks, nothing here. It, it, they can leap, like, from here to that wall. It's that far. They can jump that far. So you no tracks, words of tracks. You just so then you split up and you make big circles. Keep making bigger circles, bigger circles. Finally, oh here it is over here. Okay, and you go on more tracks, more tracks, and it jumps again. And that was really exciting. It was really fun because you knew it was out there, and you just had to, you know. And sure enough, we we uh, we got a collar on that one. Finally, that was a long damn day. <laughs> Um, the thing about, uh, I, I was absolutely fascinated by this entire experience. Um, and this is the Wyoming. I have, I have another whole thing of um, Arizona, but I'm not going to show you that because it's just way too long. But uh, the, the, the situation in Arizona, because of the whole rancher thing and the cattle predation, was just a huge other dimension. So you had a whole bunch of different interest groups like um, like biologists, the, the professional people who had this professional interest in the animal. There were the ranchers who had a huge interest in the animal because it was taking their cattle. And that is bad. That's real bad. And they, they're, some of these ranchers are also lion hunters. And their dad was a lion hunter. And their grandpa was a lion hunter. Because they've been after these animals for you know years and years and decades, because they're taking cattle. And um, then I went out when I was in Arizona. I went out with two professional lion hunters, um, both of whom were uh, employed by the federal government. So we were paying their taxes. Uh, our taxes, half of that, half of their salary came from tax, federal tax money. Half their salary came from a consortium of ranchers, say half a dozen ranchers. And these ranches are huge. They're hundreds of square miles. And there may be a half a dozen ranchers. And uh, if they had a, a cow killed, they would call this guy. And his entire job was to go out. And he'd look at the kill site, determine that indeed it was a lion. And then he would pick up that track. Uh, and his job from that moment was to go and kill that lion. And this guy that I was with, he was a young fella. He was 27. He'd been doing this since he got out of high school. He'd been doing it for 10 or 11 years. And this guy knew what he was doing. He, he thought like a cat. This guy moved like a cat. And as sure as I'm standing here, he will kill that lion. It might take him two days or two weeks. It's going to be, he's going to get it. No doubt. And these guys, these ranchers were, I, I, I was just, they were just so glad to see him show up. He, they loved him. And he, had, I, this was, I was there in January or I think, well, February, I guess. And he'd already, in that year alone, since January, killed 40 lions. Just this young kid. And, um, you know, he, we went out and he took me some places and, Boy, he, he abused me. I mean, he, he, he was running, running up through these canyons and, you know, climbing these rocks. And, you know, we, we were seeing sign everywhere. I was showing me all this sign. But uh, he had these nice rock boots on, and he could stick like glue to those canyon rocks. And I had these old clodhopper, you know, things. And it wasn't, wasn't as handy. But um, <laughs> this guy, this guy knew what he was doing. And I was really impressed. I said to him, I said, do you, do you hate mountain lions? He said, oh, no, no, I don't, I like mountain lions. He says, but, you know, I'm just trying to help these ranchers, you know, cope with this. Because they, they felt like it was truly cutting into their profit margin, for sure. Am I wrong to assume that they are sensitive species, or are they not? Well, see, this is why I'm telling you stuff. Because out there, it's an entirely different context. And in that scenario, that situation, there are people who do not like these lions. And any good lion is a dead lion. And I said, I, I, and I was the only one. So they had all these interest groups. You had, you had sportsmen. There were sports hunters. 
Uh, and the ranchers like them too, because they're killing lions. They had the professional hunters, the guides, they had professional people, the US Forest Service personnel, uh, because these cattle were running on public land, our land, and we're hiring professional hunters to go out and kill lions that are eating cows that are degrading, hugely degrading public land. I mean, I saw the, the, the grazing, you know, level of grazing they were doing. It was way, way over what it should have been. So that was interesting to me, too, that, you know, here we are whacking these lions that are eating cows that are overgrazing public land. Um, but this, this uh, interaction of all these different interest groups and, and the, those various interest groups and their uh, view towards mountain lions, it was just absolutely fascinating. But this crowd, they didn't like lions. And that's why their dad was a mountain lion hunter. And these two guys, that I went into some bar in Pumpkin Patch, Arizona, some remote place, and I, boy, I felt bad going in because I knew I was gonna stick out like a sore thumb. This is real cowboy country really cowboys and as soon as I walked in you know they, uh, who's this guy you know but the, that's where I'm meeting this professional hunter he comes in and everybody knows who he is they all have tremendous respect for him I say that guy that guy's killed 250 lions you know so he, they were these guys were revered so it is legal in Arizona anybody can shoot one mountain lion anybody that wants to uh, any day of the year because he's got a permit. He's yeah. He's hired. That's his job. His job is to kill lions. So the context is very different. And back and that's what I'm saying. I'm bringing you this perspective because back here it's it's totally different. I mean we wouldn't. This is not the view that we would have towards this critter. And then so I'd ask the guy. You know it seemed to me like I was the only one that even thought. Well, how many lions? You know how many? Is anybody worried about over? You know. Harvesting these lions and, and get rid of Oh, no, no. He said, no, that's not going to happen. And we'd stand on this little uh, precipice looking out in Arizona, and he'd say, you see that mountain range over there? Yep. You see that mountain range over there? There's lions there. There's lions there. You see that one? There? There's lions there. There's lions over there. And there were. There were. And so in one place, he'd get rid of, you know, a couple lions, and eight weeks later, a sub-adult would come off that mountain range, climb over here, over here, and you know, they're right back in business. So I seemed like I was the only one that was even concerned that there was any any issue at all with with you know whacking too many lions. But that was in a a system. This is on again on public land, so this is secure public land. But what's happening now is you have the sort of uh, Mountain ranges that, that, that hold lions, and, 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 and they're referred to as almost sky islands. Because if you consider these like as volcanic peaks in an ocean, say, that's the habitat that the lions have, is this sort of little, little sky island high up in the mountain range. They get down the valleys, and it's fragmented by roads, by you know, restaurants and malls. And, and the only way that these can continue to function is by this, if this population gets lowered or, or starting to go under, it gets replenished from over here through these connections and corridors that these lions are using. And those are starting to get chopped up. And so I think, you know, through time, it's not going to be the way they described it to me. It's, it's going to be a very different situation. Yeah, well, the way, the way cattle are ranched uh, in, for example, in Wyoming um, is on private ranches and there's lots of fences and uh, lots of patrolling going on and as I say, here in Arizona where I was, it was a free deal. They, they, the, the public land grazing fees were nothing, next to nothing. And these are hundreds of thousands of acres. And they would literally turn their cattle loose. And they'd have these drives, these roundups, in the fall and go out and get them. They'd turn them loose. So that's what I'm saying. They're out there. And um, 
Lions are eating them. But are there Makes enough, sense. Are there enough, uh, if, if perchance they change that type of open policy, open rangeland policy, would there be enough natural prey for the mountain lion? Well, that's a dynamic that's always happening. It, it's, uh, the lions are, are, would naturally be uh, preying on mule deer. Um, they also eat uh, wild pigs, uh, javelina, um, desert bighorn sheep. So in this particular area where I was in Arizona, they had just reintroduced because the desert bighorn sheep were now an endangered species. They were trying to get those reestablished, so they're bringing in desert bighorn sheep. Oh, it's another food source for lions, and we saw a bunch of predation on the bighorn sheep by lions. Uh, the drought, uh, climate conditions that would affect the vegetation also affected the prey base. So when there was drought for three years and everything dried up, um, you know, it would cause problems with the uh, deer population. And therefore, the deer population would go down, the lions would naturally shift towards the domestic cattle and, and other forms of prey. So. Well, that, that's, that's one of the issues. That's why there's supposed to be animal grazing units. Uh, and then we hire, the Fed hires uh, specialists to try to see that these animal grazing units all make sense out there and that there's enough. Uh, but I can tell you from my experience on that piece of ground that that was way out of whack. Now, the Feds, the U.S. Forest Service had indeed um, uh, we're starting to recognize the overgrazing issue. There's a great, huge political <laughs> issue about kicking ranchers off of this grazing land because they've had it for generations and generations. And um, there are a lot of ranchers that are on the, that sit on the county commissions, and that's where it all happens out there is on these county commissions. So there's a lot of political people, including ranchers, on the county commissions, and they weren't too keen on closing down public grazing rights. So that was a huge issue, and the feds. U.S. Forest Service was, was starting to back off on some of those, and one of those professional hunters that I went out with, he got kicked off for his allotment, and he was not happy, not happy at all. And he let me know right away, you're one of them government people, one of them government people. I don't trust those government people. I say, hey, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. <laughs> yeah, I know, he says. Well, uh, you know, a, a number, I mean, a fair number. Uh, this guy that I went out, the, the other, the young fellow here, oh, I, I asked him that. I, well, I'm trying to remember what he said, but again, he, he felt it was 30% of their diet, and he felt it was significant enough that, because I said, I said, is it enough really to make a difference? Is it? Oh, yeah, he said, they're right on the edge, and this is putting them under, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, and, and that's why they didn't want the grazing fees raised, and again, there, it was a very, very politically charged situation all the way around. It was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Yeah, let's talk about Vermont. <laughs> well, I think that'd be the funnest thing ever, wouldn't it be? To have them back here, I think that would be the coolest thing. Well, um, let me tell you why we're not really thinking about a reintroduction program right now. Um, they were an indigenous species to Vermont in a different time and age. And there's two issues. One is um, some of these lions have a penchant for eating people. And that doesn't go over so good. Uh, so there's that issue. The other is that their principal prey base is white -tailed, would be white-tailed deer here in Vermont. And so that's kind of a big consideration for the sportsman crowd here in Vermont. Deer herd's a very big issue. They're really not all that keen on, another, on a predator of the white-tailed deer here in Vermont. They're already worried enough about the damn coyotes. And... Um, well, they have the same attitude as the coyote here. 
Yes, they do. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that I don't know if you recall, but maybe six, eight years ago, there was discussion about reintroducing wolves back into the Northeast, and that caused a huge bunch of controversy. Um, again, another indigenous, indigenous species here in Vermont. The wolf probably is much more closely aligned uh, predator prey wise with, with the moose. And we got plenty of moose now. Um, but it's this issue of bringing in these top predators here, back here to the east, is, is very, very touchy for those reasons. Yeah? want to bring in a more beneficial top predator to us. You mean one that eats people? <laughs> Coyotes will attack people. Well, they may attack them, but, but I mean, you, you know, when you read, I mean, the, the incidence of, of... That's exactly right. Yep, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. They're filling that, that void now. Um, you know, there probably has been maybe a dozen uh, human fatalities, in, you know, negative interactions with lions in the West in the last, I don't know, 10, maybe dozen years or so, but they all make a big splash. And, you know, it just, so that's the reason why to think about reintroducing, you know, one of these top predators is, is such a big deal. And it wouldn't be done without public support. So along those lines, with the reintroduction of these top predators and the reappearance of moose, is there something changing in the ecology? Well, first of all, we're not reintroducing these top predators. And yeah, I would say moose are, are now on the verge of starting to change some of the ecology because the, they're browsing, they're really heavy browsers. And we're seeing parts, particularly in Northeast Kingdom, where the moose densities are really high, we're seeing it's difficult to regenerate, get new trees going, because the browsing pressure is so heavy. And that's part of the reason the department is, is coming down pretty hard on the moose populations, about as hard as we can. And they're still growing. What if you make a statement the other way? Did the ecology change to bring the moose back? Um, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. Certainly it changed since the 1890s when there were hardly any trees in Vermont. Um, but they probably came over from, from Maine through New Hampshire into Vermont, and now they're going down, down the Green Mountain Spine of Vermont into Massachusetts, Connecticut. Uh, so their range is expanding. Because the habitat is coming yep. mm -hmm. where it wasn't before. Right. Um, yeah. Is there any talk of a um, catamount showing up in the Adirondacks? I suspect there's a similar situation there to what we have here where there's lots of talk about, you know, lions showing up here and there. Um, and we may as well jump into that right now. So the deal in Vermont. So I get, like I said, anywhere from 40 to 60 sightings a year that come into my office alone. Um, and there's no shortage of sightings. We get lots of sightings. And there's no discernible pattern that I can see as to where lions are being spotted. It, it, there's no concentration areas. It's not like the mountains. They're heavy in the mountains and not in the valleys. They're literally, we're getting sightings from border to border in Vermont. In fact, from, even from some cemetery in the north part of Burlington to the really remote areas of the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so, no shortage of sightings. What we have a shortage of is real, hard, physical evidence um, to go with the sightings that lions are here. And I can tell you that based on my really limited knowledge of this critter, when you're in lion country, uh, I could find lion sign in a matter of hours. That young kid I was telling you about can find it in 20 minutes. And, and I don't mean just a single, you know, scat. I'm talking about scent mounds and, and uh, you know, he, he, we would just, he'd just say, follow me, come this way. And we'd run into 
um, all kinds of signs, scat and scratchings and scent mounds along this trail, along say the rim, rim of some canyon. So it's, it's, not, it's not that tough to find. And like I said, I don't know much about it. And I think within a half a day, if, there were, if I was in lion country, we could see sign. Um, we put about, uh, on Vermont roads, we put 8 billion miles a year of road travel on them every year and we kill everything on those roads from little bitty mice to great big moose and everything in between and we have not yet ended up with a lion on our bumper mm -hmm. and well because I think we don't have enough lions for them to wish to show up you hope that <laughs> you hope that <laughs> yeah well, you know, every once in a while I get kind of a grainy photo come in or a photo of a track or, um, you know, I'll get a grainy, really grainy um, video that says, see, see that thing moving through the grass there? Uh, there's nothing real, real great, nothing real solid. Um, but, again, these critters, they have to eat and they have to have kill sites and they have to have carcasses. And they have to leave evidence that they're there. We don't see that. We put 80,000, 90,000 hunters a year out in the woods, and we're not coming up with that. Um, so now, having said that, uh, so he I'm here to tell you that there is no evidence, no evidence that we have a viable mountain lion population in Vermont. We don't see it. And I'd love to see it, but I'm not seeing it. Not that I know of. There is in Manitoba. They've reached as far as Manitoba. Um, but the other thing I was going to say was, now that I've said that, is do I think that everybody calls me with a mountain lion sighting is a nut? And the answer is no, because I do kind of think that there is a trade, illicit trade now, in lots of exotic critters nationwide. I have been on the internet. You could go on the internet tonight in 20 minutes and you can buy yourself a mountain lion. You can buy an adult for two grand. You can buy a cub for 500 bucks. And there's lots of people like me that think the, these things are cool as could be. And it wouldn't it be great to have one. Um, so I think, I don't think every single sighting, I mean, because every once in a while, uh, you know, we get a lot of misidentifications. We followed up sites. We get, we get uh, mountain lions, the reporters mountain lions that we know are fisher, that we know are coyotes, that we know are bobcats, that we know are domestic cats. Um, but every once in a great while, maybe once a year, maybe once every two years, I get a sighting that sounds really, really good. Really good. So what we do is we, we, we document with, with someone who calls in a sighting, any one of you, and we, I pull out this sheet and we go through a whole series of questions. I ask all kinds of questions. This is over the phone. You know, what'd you see? When'd you see it? Describe it. Describe the animal. What kind of habitat? Time of day? How long did you see it? How far away? And through that conversation, it sort of, you can sort of get a picture. And sometimes I come away and I say, I have no idea what that was. And then sometimes, if there appears that there is a reason that there's some evidence left, like tracks in the winter, then we'll come out and we'll look at the site. Lots of times I get sightings that are weeks old. You know, oh no, this was back in February that I, <laughs> or you know, after the rainstorm or whatever. So if there's reason to think that we could find some evidence there, we'll we'll go to the site. Um, but every once in a while, I mean, sometimes people tell me things over the phone that they about behavior that they shouldn't know, things I haven't told you about tonight, mm -hmm. that that people shouldn't know, unless you know lions. And so when I hear things like that, there's a couple trigger phrases that I listen for, and then I think, hmm, this sounds pretty good. So I'm thinking that perhaps uh, we do know, for example, that New York had a bus two, two years ago, three years ago, two or three years ago, where there was a bus, the guy was harboring two lions and some, some other exotic cat, I forget, and cops busted him for that. It was illegal. Um, Massachusetts used to have permits, legal permits, to, to have these exotic critters. And I think those could be respond, those escaped animals or whatever, either intentionally released or escaped, may explain 
you know, a few of these really good sounding sightings. Vermont doesn't issue permits for, you know, for having them domestically. That doesn't mean that it's not happening. But, um, and I don't know how many long, many of you have been around, but I was a kid in South Burlington when UVM had a catamount as a mascot. It was the coolest thing you could imagine. You go to a UVM hockey game and the Liggetts of South Burlington who bought this mountain lion as a pup, as a, as a, as a um, cub, and then the thing grew up to be 120 pounds. And they would, per, when the Zamboni and the hockey game, uh, in the period, in the, between periods when they'd run the Zamboni out, the Liggetts would get that thing on a leash and they'd parade around the ice. Did anybody else see this? And the place would erupt. I mean, the place was erupting. And I felt really sorry for that, that critter because it was afraid. But uh, it was such a hoot. And then we knew about one other one. Now, that critter grew up, and the Liggetts it literally ate them out of house and home. They, they couldn't afford to feed it because they, they eat fresh meat. And the UVM cheerleaders did this sort of a little uh, fundraising thing for Rink. They called it Rink. Um, and, you know, that worked for a little while. Basically, the Liggetts said, I can't, we can't handle it. They, they brought some zoo in Illinois. We knew about one other. We busted a guy in um, Barrie who had a pet mountain lion. And that was, I think that was in the 80s. Um, we don't know about any sense. But. So I think it is possible that with this really ubiquitous trade in uh, exotic pets, um, that might explain some of the, a couple of these really good sightings. Yeah? It could. What you need is a local source. You need a source population for them to disperse from. And that's why we're seeing a real range expansion from the, the Rocky Mountain West eastward toward, and they've made it to the uh, Missouri, uh, Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of sightings now. We're getting sightings in Kansas. We're getting in Nebraska, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota. You know, very regular, you know, documented sightings with, with real critters. Um, uh, South Dakota is whacking lions on the highways. Now, there's an example. I mean, they have they have estimated population in South Dakota of 200 animals statewide, and in the last three years, they've whacked 27 on the highways in three years. Now, this is in South Dakota, which isn't exactly you know metropolitan downtown Burlington. So, um, I, I'm saying that if there were a bunch of lions around. We wouldn't have to guess. We wouldn't have to say, hmm, is there, is it? We'd know it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Have you or anybody here ever read the book by Jane Gray, The Young Lion Mother, or uh, Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon? No. <laughs> that was around in the 1930s. I read it when I was that one and some years old. In fact, my brother and sister. Tell you what, I you'd want to think about messing with one of these. I'll tell yeah. you. Is there any other animal? I mean, with or would have a tail practically as long as your body and be about that. But well, I mean, we've we've had Fisher. Like you say, it would be might be one that he got loose somewhere. 
Yeah. yeah. But I mean, we have we have Fisher sightings that that people have reported as lion sightings. They didn't know what they are, and they said it was a mountain lion, and turns out how it was. How big do they grow? Fisher? Yeah. Not real big. Be that. But what what's happening? Some I get I got a call in Rutland, and mm -hmm. uh, a cat sighting, and he said, no, it's just walk across the field. I am telling you, it's a cat. So I come down. It was winter. It was tracks. Great, fresh tracks. Let's go. Went down there, and there was a cat, all right. It was a domestic cat. It was that big. <laughs> and what he, what he didn't have, it was out in this field, he didn't have the perspective of scale. Yeah. So it, it surely was a cat. And that's the guy called me. But um, So we, we've had, you know, and then I read it, one of my, uh, some of the line literature that even in known range, like in the West, 75% of the sightings that people report in as lions are inaccurate. And this is in known lion country. Can you tell the difference between a mountain lion cry and a bobcat cry? Or? Oh gosh, I mm, I don't know. I don't know if I could. I I I haven't heard enough of that to <laughs> to know. If a uh, population started to move into the area, is there a belief that the uh, ecology, that the environment here? Oh, I, I think I think we could support one right now. We have a deer. It's all about prey base. We have a deer herd that could support <coughs> lions. I, in fact, I think better than the Adirondacks because our deer population is higher here. Would there necessarily be a conflict between you know, the deer population being there for hunters and being there for lions? Because we went to a full predator presentation at Wind Cave National Park in the uh, you know, Black Hills, and the ranger's point about Well, yeah, that's true. I think it all depends on your perspective whether you consider them to be significant competition or not. I don't think I would necessarily, but there are sure are others that surely would. I, I think it'd be quite controversial uh, with our deer herd in Vermont and with our with our deer hunters if we suggest that we bring in, you know, mountain lions or or wolves. But as a scientist, you think. It's I think I think we have the habitat to support them. I do. Yep. So does that uh, tend to mean that uh, at some point in time it's almost inevitable? Strength? Possibly. Strength Possibly it is inevitable. Um, just think about what they have to get through to get here, though. I mean, it's, it's a hell of a gauntlet. Just the border. Well, way less in Canada than here. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I think they're starting to have good <coughs> documentation in Illinois. Just a few. So that's why I say they pretty much reached the Mississippi. You know, a few of them. And these are dispersing animals. These are some adults, those dispersers, you know, that are just <laughs> taken off. So it's not, you know, a reproductive population. These are just individuals well, that are making these forays. How many uh, endangered species Well, it, that's a tough answer. The whole genetics issue is, is all messed up now because of what I told you about. It, they thought there were 32 species and, and you know, if you're going to reintroduce a critter, you want it to be the one that was preferably, you want it to be the one that's genetically identical, the one that was here. And now, you know, uh, this whole genetic issue is all very cloudy. The same with, with wolf reintroduction. You know, they can't figure out what wolf was here, what species, and so therefore they're having trouble figuring out. If we did want to release them, what would we put out there? I don't even mean reintroduction. I mean that inevitability where a population at some point in the next 50, 100, 200 years starts <coughs> to uh, Well, here the federal food. government treats um, the eastern <coughs> cougar as, uh, currently treats it as um, endangered but presumed to be extinct. And last year I wrote a... Um, the feds, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service requested a status report from each state, particularly the eastern states, about the 
state agency's view of the current status of the eastern cougar, uh, in our case in the state of Vermont, and they um, have queried all the states in the east, and we sent that, those reports off, and supposedly somebody is, is reviewing that and is going to take a second, another look at that whole um, question of how the feds are going to treat this species. I don't know what, what's going to come out of it. How about at the state level? They're state endangered as well. I think I saw four yeah. more hands up, so if you're willing, we'll do four sure, more questions. Sure, sure. I'm talk about lions all night. It's all right with me. How, how big a population is there of mountain lions in, for instance, Arizona or in Wyoming? Do you have any idea? I don't know. There's a lot. I, I can't tell you. I don't know. That's a lot. There's a lot of lions in Arizona. A lot. <laughs> because there's a lot of mountains. I had no idea. <laughs> Arizona is folded up like an accordion. It really is. Even I was just right outside of Phoenix, within an hour of Phoenix. And it's beautiful lion habitat. I'd like to ask what could be an animal of these two that appears the same shape? One crossed the road, whatever it was, <laughs> in front of me. And it was probably like this. Now why didn't you hit it? <laughs> <laughs> Bring it in. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I mean, again, I, as I say, we've had, we've had fishers reported as lions, uh, bobcats. Um, the coyotes have tails as long as that. Um, You know, the truth is, even if we had, even if somebody clubbed one tonight and brought it in here, the truth is, we wouldn't have any way of determining its origin because of this genetics issue, because they're all genetically identical. Well, with some minor exceptions, Florida is a bit of a different deal because there, there's some inbreeding going on down there. But, but rather than that, um, we wouldn't be able to tell if this was an indigenous, if it was lying right here, we wouldn't be able to tell if it was an indigenous Vermont catamount or a mountain lion from Idaho. And it's the color you threw that off the color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was curious, what would be the size of the population that would be introduced on the staff of the record they're using before they get to one on their own? And what do you think would happen if this happened just by people releasing them? <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, well, it, there, there, it's a, another tough question, another long answer, and I'll try to make sure, but how many would you need? Uh, that gets down the whole question of population viability, what size of a population need to, to stay viable. Then you've got to ask the question, how long do you want it to be viable for? Do you want it to be viable for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 mm -hmm. years? Depending on the answer to that question, the number gets bigger each time. If you want to say, for, for like, like right now, indefinitely, I've read stuff that says you've got to have at least 500 to, 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 to remain viable indefinitely. If you're talking about a much shorter period of time, then maybe, you know, 50. But recognize that, you know, you're going to have losses, like they do in other states, like they have in South Dakota with 200 animals. They're losing 9 or 10 a year. Florida is down to less than 100. They were down to less than 50. And they brought in some Texas lions and, and interbred with a Florida panther, and they got a little mini surge. They're up close to 100. They lost 17 last year just to road traffic. So almost all the reproduction was taken out by road traffic. So. That, and then you've got to throw in all the habitat issues. I mean, we're losing, you know, 6,500 acres a year in Vermont to development. 6,500 acres a year. And so multiply that times 10 and, you know, highways and fragment habitat fragmentation, public tolerance, social carry capacity. I mean, how much tolerance is there going to be for lions showing up in people's yards, you know, uh, you know trying to whack their dogs or or grab their kids or, you know. I mean, it's, it, you know, it, 
so I don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what do you tell the people that think or know this thing they had? What I tell them? And, and it's not a link, it's not a podcast, and it's not that black thing to introduce the kill porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> What do I tell them? I say, good for you. That's great. I'd love to see it myself. That'd be fantastic. It's unforgettable. It's it's unbelievable. It's just like magic. Well, I'm glad to see you say that I've had three stabbings in my lifetime, and I don't have anything else like the band. Bring it in, will ya? Could be. Two of them could have been in the same one. Different time. The other one would have been after. Yes, sir. I've seen some awfully big coyotes. Can coyotes breed with wolves to make super big coyotes? Uh, yeah, that's another loaded question. But, yeah, that, that, that's, that's possible, yes. We think we, we've got some big, we've had some big coyotes in the last couple of years. In fact, I don't know if you read about this 92-pound animal that was shot as a coyote in, I think it was Craftsbury in mm, 2006, maybe. 92 pounds. Huh? It was Troy. That's right. This one was in Troy. Um, we've since done the DNA on that, and that turned out to be a wolf. Um, so when we talk again about wolf reintroduction, because that was discussed seriously by the federal government and amongst the northeastern state agencies. Um, one issue is what, if we do it, first of all, is the public going to buy it? And it didn't appear that that was the case, too controversial. Secondly, if we did it, what one would we bring back here? Because we want one that would be really close to one like the one we had, so it would function in the same way in the ecosystem. And the third one was, one of the concerns is that if you don't bring, say, a few wolf packs into, if you, if you have this goal that you want wolves in Vermont, if that's your goal, and you don't bring in several wolf packs to establish a population in amongst themselves so there's interbreeding with, within packs and between packs, uh, if you don't do that, that's one option. The other is just let it happen naturally. We do have a much more local source of wolves. Um, there are wolves in Canada just north of us. They've got a gauntlet to get through. They've got to get across the St. Lawrence for one and then all that ag country between here and there. But every once in a while one gets through and Maine's got a couple of confirmed uh, animals over there and then we had one. Um, the trouble with that is is that if, you, if they're around looking for mates there's nothing to mate with except a coyote. So then, what are you going to end up with for coyotes? You're going to end up with a super coyote. And that may not go over so well. <laughs> or, do you, or do you bring in a few packs and, and let them you know, get established? So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of issues and a lot of questions. And this top predator business is, is really tricky. Um, thank you all for coming out. We have some refreshments here, some cider, apple juice. You may need it for the heat in here. <laughs> Doug, if you'll stick around to take yeah. questions from individuals, that'd be great. Um, if, if you have chairs without cushions, the ones in the middle have cushions, leave those. The ones on the outside, if you could fold them up.